Hey guys, Jim with Crawfordology. We got a great show for you today. A lot of things are happening. Uh, we're going to talk about the president and the sterilization of humankind as the as the Dems are rolling out. We've got to talk about uh, what's happening behind the scenes with these governors and your tax dollars. And holy cow, look at North Korea. What is happening there? This is going to be a big shift potentially for that region. Kim Jong-un and more. Times have never been more uncertain than they are today. We've got COVID-19. We've got weird things happening, not just in the United States, but around the world. And in times like these, you really have to be able to rely on your equipment. So I, I want to just give you a, a, a good word on where to go to get those things taken care of. Our sponsors at ThreatWorks take care of your firearms. They can do industrial coatings. They can do laser engraving. You can look good and be safe at the same time. Check out our folks at ThreatWorks. It's T-H-R-E-A-T-W-E-R-X dot com. Go there for your Cerakote, your laser engraving, and your Hydra Dip needs. Check them out. So, guys, uh, you know, we saw last week with uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan and some of the nonsense that was going on with her pulling a contract and then giving that contract to one of her political operatives. Um, now, it looks like there's a big rollback happening. I think some of the other folks have, have gotten involved in Michigan politics. They realize the optics on this aren't good. And now we see them canceling the contract. Um, you know, the folks over at Great Lakes Community Engagement, uh, the company that uh, had the connections to K2K Consulting, they've yanked that contract. They said it was an accident, that they didn't realize that, uh, you know, the person who worked on her campaign was also the person that they might be giving a new contract to, which is a slightly different name to the organization. So I don't know that anything was, was you know, intentional, but I want to tell you times like these where we are really trying to spend emergency funding for, through our states creates a huge opportunity for this to happen, not just in your states, but in your local communities. You're going to want to keep an eye out locally, certainly at the state level and at the national level. Um, you know, we've, we've seen with the Paytech Paycheck Protection uh, Program, many companies having to, and, and institutions, giving back their funding. Um, you know, this was intended for small businesses, and somehow Harvard University picked up some, some pretty substantial funding. Ruth's Chris Steakhouse uh, ends up picking up some big funding. A lot of large companies, some publicly traded companies, have, have ended up with some of that, uh, that money. Those companies have other mechanisms that they can manage and, and borrow money against. This was certainly intended for your small businesses. So if this is happening to programs that are you know, across the country, I guarantee it's happening in your own states. Keep a close eye out on your politicians. Make sure that they're not suddenly giving contract dollars to their cronies. We're in an election season. What an easy way to send money that later shows up in, in campaign funds or ads or uh, other uh, equal sorts of trade. So definitely be vigilant. We, we want to know. If you see something like that, you've got some, some guesses it's going on, you can connect some dots for us. Put it in the comments. Make sure you send it to us. Connect with us directly. You can visit us on our website where we've got a way that you can, you can email straight to us, and that's at thecrawfordology.com. So we'll put it in the links uh, you know, over here. So, you know, a another thing has happened this, uh, this week that we we've seen the president comes out every week and he's talking to folks and he's really spontaneous. He's, he's, he's riffing. Uh, he's not talking, you know, we saw in the last, in the last, uh, president through Obama, we had a number of, uh, teleprompters and almost everything was very carefully, decided. What's he going to say? How's he going to say it? What's, what's the delivery? Uh, the pauses, the question marks, the facial expressions. I can imagine 
there were pictures for him to emulate when he was looking at the teleprompter. You know, when you say this, look surprised, right? When you say this, look sad. You know, obviously, Donald Trump doesn't do that. He says things, you know, very much off, off the top of his head. And sometimes he says some things that come out and seem a little crazy because he doesn't use exactly the right wording. In, in the case of um, this past week, we heard him say something about, uh, or at least what the media is continuing to, to run over and over, is injecting you know, some sort of sterilizing material, uh, some, some sort of cleanser. Uh, I think I heard somebody saying it was Clorox, somebody else saying it was a Lysol-like substance. But, you know, medically, there are products that we do inject. We do take things, uh, inhalers, for example, um, have an atomized delivery system that allows you to deliver the medicine straight into your lungs. He was talking about those, you know, getting the bacteria out of the lungs. There are UV light treatments that, that apparently are given, you know, internally. I've not seen these work, but I understand that there are methods where, where this happens. We certainly use UV light to sterilize things in hospitals, uh, in surgical centers. You can see that it's, it's one of the sterilization methods to kill germs. We, we know it works. So, you know, we got to give, we got to give the president a little bit of a break here. Everyone knows he wasn't suggesting you take an IV and hook it up to a Clorox bottle or that uh, you, you somehow hook the aerosol from Lysol right into an intravenous uh, flow. He was talking about some, some legitimately supported by medical research types uh, of solutions that deliver that medicine to kill bacteria right where they live. Lungs are a tough spot, right? But we have things like nebulizers and that atomize medicine, get it down into the lungs, down into the airway so that... Uh, so that it can, it can act most effectively. So I'm not sure what those medicines are. If you're a doctor, if you're a researcher, you're listening to the program, please type it in. Tell us, tell us what you've got. Nurses, you guys probably know as much about this as anyone. Let us know how that works. You know, was the, was the president totally off base? Do we need to correct him? Or is there really something that works like this? So, you know, keeping in mind, it, it's, it's that extemporaneous way of speaking that Donald Trump has that makes him so effective in many ways, but it also causes some, some difficulties sometimes for him to roll back quickly. So we saw you know, Fauci and, and, and the, the different folks who were engaged uh, this week with some of the looks of surprise, but uh, I think all in all, our president's doing a great job. Keep it up, you know, keep going, let's get the country back open. Now, speaking of that, this, this week some, some states are starting to open yesterday. Uh, Friday we saw states opening. We're going to be paying close attention to how that's working. In Virginia, and you know we always talk a lot about Virginia, and I'm sorry for that, but I live here and it's close. Um, our governor has come up with a plan that looks like it may take uh, two years to get through phase one. Now, I can't imagine how many people are going to stay in the state if everyone around us, now luckily we don't have him for two more years, I guess just, just barely two more years. Um, so he can only maybe get to phase one and then someone more reasonable hopefully will come in and, and move things along at a, at a normal pace. But uh, two years to get to phase one, what are all the folks going to do who do personal services? You know, what are folks going to do who have uh, gyms, who, who do hair salons, you know, any, any of your personal service folks. How are our restaurants going to survive? How are they going to pay the rent for two plus years uh, without being able to be open to the public? Are, are, we, are these places going to turn into caterers? And if, and if the tenants can't pay the rent, how are the building owners going to pay the real estate taxes, the mortgages, the insurance on those buildings with no revenue? Um, I mean, maybe what the governor's looking for is a return to, you know, Walton Mountain, where we'll all be living in little wooden shacks with little country stores on the corner, because I don't know that there is a way that's economically feasible to have a two-year return to normalcy. 
Uh, can we do? Can we take some some precautions and roll some things out? I would think so. I don't know if he has the most careful people in the world who are creating this plan, but you've got to have some risk takers because I can tell you, not Virginia itself was built from risk takers. No one came to start Jamestown settlement as a a you know careful, cautious, hey, don't go outside, you'll catch pneumonia type of person. These were folks who were saying, hey, there's something over there. Over where? I don't know. It's on the other side of that big body of water. I thought that was flat. No, let's go. So these folks were jumping in boats, going from Europe to to a new land that they'd never seen, but had only heard stories of. So I, I, I don't think that Virginians at their heart are going to put up with a two-year rollout. So we want to hear what you're thinking. Are you willing to stay home for two years? Can you stay in your house for just, I mean, just two more years, right? Not, not two more weeks, two more years, two more years, two Christmases from now. Are you willing to do that? I, I, I can't imagine. I, I feel like, uh, you remember that Back to the Future movie, you know, hello, McFly, is anybody there? Is, is that what's going on in our governor's head? Two years of a rollout. Ridiculous. I can tell you another thing. If that happens, the the amount of business that will leave Virginia, the amount of people that will leave Virginia, I I, I don't understand it. <laughs> I really don't understand it. So if you've got something to say about it, put it in comments. We want to hear what you're thinking. Are you happy with a two-year rollout? You states, you know, we've got lots of listeners from other states. I want to know how it's working in Georgia. How's it working in Texas? Are you feeling safe? Are you seeing the rollout happening responsibly? I saw the governor of Georgia has put some some very, you know, careful measures in play. So he was taking a lot of criticism earlier in the week for, you know, just this lackadaisical, let's, let's roll the wheel and see what happens. But truthfully, he's put some careful measures in place. So we want to know over the coming days how you feel. Is it safer? Do you feel do you feel concerned when you go out? Are you feeling protected? Are you feeling like there's some middle ground between two years and tomorrow or yesterday? So I think that there is a uh, that there's a way that our reasonable Crawfordology followers have a have some great insights on this state by state. List your state. Tell us what you're doing where you are. Thanks for that. So I want to go now to international, um, and okay, I, I got to start this story back with my own personal experience, 1988, um, I landed in Osan Air Base in South Korea. Uh, first time I had flown internationally, I was 18, 19 years old, and I took two weeks of in-country leave um, when I first arrived in Korea. And, you know, I don't know what I was really expecting, I guess, 18, 19-year-olds maybe don't have, or at least I didn't have, um, the greatest plan in place. I was willing to just uh, just go for it and see what happens. So I remember walking out of Osan Air Base, and there were two things that really hit you before you landed in, in Osan. You could see the colors of Korea, very rich you know, colors, the roof tiles, the houses, uh, the fields, you know, very colorful. And, and the second thing was there was a very different smell. And, and I, I never will forget this smell, but it was just, you know, different foods, garbage, uh, rice patties that had been, uh, you know, fertilized many times with human waste. Um, and it would hit you at about 1,000 feet. You could, you could get this, this smell would come into the plane, and you were like, okay, we're, we're back in Korea. Um, now, this is the 1980s. It was a very different country. Uh, they had, they were just hosting in 1988 the Seoul Olympics, um, which which opened up the country in a lot of ways. It created a, a roadway system. Uh, suddenly, you had people in Korea starting to drive cars for the first time. So I can remember I was there as people were just starting to, or it became more common, like it is here in the U.S. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to go back, and I and and, and by the way, I, I lived at, at the very northern part of South Korea, 
Uh, I was there on the DMZ, right by the MGM River, just north of the MGM River, at a place called Camp Greaves with the 1st of 506 Infantry. And our job was to patrol a, a particular section of, uh, of the DMZ, and, and we had some other missions that were related. Now, that base has since been closed, but I went back um, 30 years later. And Korea is an incredible economy. When, when I was there, there were two or three American restaurants that you could go. And, and I'm not kidding. I mean, to go get a pizza at Pizza Hut in Seoul was like a treat because it was like 50 bucks in 1988. I mean, you, you had to really want bad pizza to go to Pizza Hut in Seoul, South Korea. Um, today, there are... 1,400 or 1,300 or 1,400 Starbucks in Seoul alone. Kentucky Fried Chicken, I mean, any restaurant you want, McDonald's, Taco Bell's on every corner, very similar to a U.S. city. So it's, it's really changed a lot. Traffic is incredibly dense. Uh, when I drove up, uh, I took a tour, took my wife with me. We went up to, uh, to the place where I had been. And uh, we were able to we were able to to, uh, to see the old Freedom Bridge, which was a one-way train bridge that uh, we had we had put wooden t timbers over, and that became the transportation bridge where we drove across. And uh, you know that bridge is no longer in use, but it's still there. Uh, the guard post is still there on both sides, and there is actually a fair-like environment on the south side of the river major highways that run all the way to the south side of the river in many places in South Korea. So it was, it was quite amazing to see the differences, the contrast. Now, if you went to North Korea and, and, and understand that the South Korean people long for unification with North Korea, you know, this, this would be like any of your states just drawing a line through the state and saying everyone on the north side of this state is in this country, everyone on the south side of this line is, on, is in, in this state uh, or this country, and, and basically just splitting any of, our, any of our environments into two. In many cases, families were separated. Uh, you had fathers separated from mothers, husbands from wives, siblings separated. And there's unification works that have happened over the last 30, 40 years where they would try to establish you know, some, some reconnecting with those folks. And what you can see in North Korea is that the economy there has suffered. It has not been at all like the explosive growth that's happened in South Korea. The introduction of technology, the introduction and acceptance in the world community, the ability of companies like Samsung, Hyundai, to create you know, powerhouse brands that are that are now thriving globally. And, you know, I dare anyone here to name the brands that come out of North Korea. And the reason is you can't. There aren't brands that come out of North Korea. At least they don't make it to the Western world. What you have in North Korea is you have a very, um, gosh, a, a very harsh dictatorship uh, that was started by, by Kim Il-sung uh, right after the end of, uh, of the Korean War, and f flowed to his son, uh, let's see, Kim Jong-il, and to his son, Kim Jong-un. So, so you have three generations that ha it, has, it really worked like a monarchy, uh, even though that was not the country style. It's, it's a communist state. So it's, it's, uh, it, this would be like Joseph Stalin had... Uh, had kids and was able to just pass it down from, from kid to kid. So through that, they have, they have forced the ideas of fear. They have forced the ideas of, uh, you know, that the boogeyman lived south of the Mjim River. Uh, that anything, and, and true stories, I mean, they used to say that Americans were cannibals, that we would eat them if we got them. And that's what they were protecting us from were protecting their North Korean people. Many, many stories of abduction, of murders, of just a terrible thing that happens. You can, you can look up Pam Munjam, you can look up Camp Boniface, so you can see about the beheading that happened at the, at the bridge there. 
Um, some very strange rituals have continued and lore has, has continued out of North Korea. Uh, it is demanded that absolute loyalty be shown to any of the, uh, any of the North Korean citizenry m- must love their, their chairman. If they don't, they have things like dog pits. Uh, you may have heard that uh, Un killed his uncle with an anti-aircraft gun. Um, you know, it's not just a, an execution. It's not a punishment. It's a form of entertainment in this country to make sure that you do things in such a way that it's brutal, that it's talked about, and that it creates more fear. So now, finally, it looks like, uh, you know, this, uh, this dictator has, uh, has, has had a reckoning of his own. Uh, this morning, the Japanese uh, <coughs> network had, uh, had, had actually announced that uh, Kim Jong-un has died. Uh, HKS TV in Hong Kong has said, and, and the New York Post, they're reporting that uh, Kim Jong-un is in a vegetative state. So, you know, the, th- the 36-year-old leader has, has come to, s- to some hardship in his, in his uh, short life. And either that is a vegetative state or he may have, have already succumbed to whatever those, uh, those wounds were or, or the outcome of a botched heart surgery. Um, unknown. But what, it, what we do know is it, w- it was very unlikely that, or, or very, sus- I guess, uh, created a lot of suspicion when Kim Jong Un did not show up for the 108th birthday party of his great grand or of his grandfather, uh, Kim Jong Il, um, or Kim Il Sung, so th- this is a national celebration. Like our Fourth of July, they they really bring everybody out for those days. It's a definite time that you're going to hear speeches from, you know, leading party members and and certainly from the country leader himself. And, and grandson of the leader. So surprisingly, we have you know, the potential for a vacuum in power there in North Korea. So a couple of things we need to think about is what's this going to look like moving forward? If, if he is in fact gone, uh, there's already people speculating on what this may look like. Uh, you know, North Korea has been a patriarchal society. It's, it does rely on the male figure for the most part. However, in this case, uh, Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, is, uh, you know, has been the sister and head of the ruling party. So she has been a key advisor. Uh, she's been lauded by the West as, as somebody who you know, has some style and she likes to dress in the latest fashions. So she, she certainly um, at least has one eye on, on the Western world, as, as has, uh, you know, his brother, uh, who is the big uh, Eric Clapton, big, big music fan, and I think not interested at all in leadership or being a politician of any type. There's also the, the possibility of collective rule. Uh, you know, Russia, after Stalin's death, created a collective rule. If that happens, it's, it's probably going to be a guy named Cho Rong He. And, uh, and he, would, he would step in and build some sort of a, a Politburo-like committee to, to rule the country, either for the short term or for potentially the long term. Uh, the Sejong Institute, uh, there's an analyst there, Chong Xiong Chang, who's in South Korea, who has said, you know, this, this is a, a, a good possibility that there will be some sort of a collective rule. Um, there is also a look back, and this is, is Kim Jong-il's half-brother. So Kim Jong-un's father's brother, his uncle, uh, Kim Pyong-il, who's 65 years old and potentially could act in, as, as kind of a, a patriarch to the country in the near term. But one thing is for certain is we've, we've got to encourage, as our president continues to do, North Korea to move into modernity, to, to look at 
opening up trade, to look at opening up communication. So I talked at the beginning of this about the highways that have now been built and stop at 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 the M Jim River. You know, th- and I don't mean to say these are like two lane roads. I mean these are like six lane, four lane highways that uh, that go and stop right at at the bridge. Uh, and maybe in some cases the bridge has been built, but you you would have to extend that on into to North Korea. Um, this is an opportunity to really see trade, maybe improve the quality of life of the North Korean people, to see North Korea adopt some of those South Korean uh, methods and and styles that have really led them into uh, become becoming an Asian powerhouse. I mean, there's no question about it if you just look at the timeline and you look at the two outcomes uh, both states following the Korean War were pummeled I mean they had been annihilated there there wasn't even before the Korean War with the Japanese occupation the Japanese cut every tree from the Korean Peninsula the the Japanese needed materials so they simply went in in many cases to those states like like South Korea, North North Korea, uh, China, uh, and and took product. They they would take natural resources. So it's uh, it, it neither neither side of of uh, the fortieth parallel started with a great deal of natural resources uh, right after the war. But if you just look at what they've been able to build, North Korea has built. Uh, cities that were built for show, uh, much like a model or a, 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 a these idyllic kind of dystopian societies, where people, you know, eat plastic vegetables and look at cardboard TVs, so that from, you know, long range telemetry, it looks as if everybody's happy with lots of uh, lots of things, but all the time we know that there's just not the resources in North Korea that there have been in South Korea. The South Korean people have become some of the healthiest people in Asia. Uh, they're males and females both looking at the average height, weight, health. It, it, is, it is far beyond what I encountered in 1988. Um, it, has, it is really just an incredible city. One of the coolest airports in the world is, is the Seoul Airport. There are things there from virtual reality to tech walls and just ex- you you have experiences in the airport that are better than a lot of cities experiences of course they were a host again to the olympics and and that always drives some of the economic incentives that uh, that cause us to make airports better but some very nice things have happened there in south korea we're going to be following this story seeing what happens seeing if in fact uh, kim jong un is is gone um but we want to hear what you think. You know, do is there a place for America to play in this discussion? Do we still want to work with North Korea? Uh, you know, the president's been pretty clear about it. But we want to know what you think. Do we have the bandwidth? Do we have the resources to still be the leader of the free world? Are we going to finally step back and let China take that part? So we want to hear from you. We're looking forward to to he- hearing. Your words, your likes, your comments, you know, we certainly want to make sure that you reach out, you share your thoughts, and if you haven't already, make sure you like our page, share our page, visit us on YouTube and on Instagram and, of course, Facebook. Thanks. Have a great one. Be safe.